So we did a little prayer, we set us off in the right direction. The Tibetans often say you set your motivation. You sort of, put, so I think we might say state our purpose. Why are we here together tonight, you know? Um, so we could say this little prayer, the first two lines, actually the first two lines are, are expressing for those of us in the room who already identify with being a Buddhist, it's, re it's reiterating our reliance on the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. And then the second two lines can be this motivation that we're going to listen to these teachings and that includes me, I'm talking, but believe me, I'm listening, um, to, to listen to it as practical advice. It's really important we hear it as advice, like recipes, like tools, you know, not just as interesting information. You mightn't want to take the advice, that's okay, you know. I mean, Buddha's not forcing it down our throats. But to listen to it in that way, and the, the advice is for what? Well, it's to develop two wings of the bird, if you like. A bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So we're going to maybe focus mostly on the compassion, on the wisdom wing, which is the, the, the teachings about karma and the mind, Buddha's view about the mind. And so this is so that we can put ourselves together, so that then we're useful to others. This is the whole point, you know. For our own sake and for the sake of others, we're going to listen to these teachings, so that we can develop this marvellous potential that Buddha says we've all, we all possess, which we'll talk about, you know. I'll sing this little prayer in Tibetan. Sange charang soke chog nam la jang chu badu dagni kyab su chi dagi chonien gi pe sonam ki drola penchir sange drupa shog sange charang soke chog nam la jang chu badu dagni kyab su chi dagi chonien gi pe sonam ki drola penchir sange drupa shog sange charang soke chog nam la jang chu badu dagni kyab su chi dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki drola penchir sange drupa sho all right so i think it's always important to remind us um the source of these teachings you know because then that, when we understand that properly, it really, the implication is really, the experiential implication is really important. It's, it, it, it informs the way we listen to the teachings. I mean, and so here, you know, for example, I was brought up as a Catholic and I had great faith in God. I was, you know, I was a great Catholic. I loved, I loved God. I was a naughty girl, but I also loved God. But the difference here, and it's not meant to be critical, I have great confidence, I have great um, respect for all people who think in the world, the religious people, philosophical people, people who try to put the, make the world a better place. I would never, dis, you know, never criticize any one of them. I might disagree, but I wouldn't criticize. But the crucial point about the Buddha is we, we sort of vaguely know, but we should look at, we should join the dots. We know he's not a creator, and we know he doesn't posit a creator. And that's the crucial difference. So, and the difference it should be in the way we listen to Buddha's teachings. So if I'm a Catholic, because God is the creator, God is the source of the universe, God is the source of me, God is the boss, basically, and that means God also holds the power to punish and reward. In fact, you know, a sin or a negative action, I asked my Jesuit priest friend, by definition is doing what God said not to do. They talk about natural law, he said. For example, we know that Jesus says don't kill. And they, they say there's a natural law there that, that in the sense that people don't like getting killed. But the real thing that defines killing as wrong if you're a Christian is because God said you shouldn't. And I'm not criticizing, but that's not the Buddha's view. That is not the Buddha's view because he's not a creator. Therefore, he's not a punisher. Therefore, he's not a rewarder. So then what is Buddha? Well, Buddha's like an advisor, you know. He's seen from his own experience. This person called Buddha came out of this extraordinary tradition that we know was in India before him. I remember the Dalai Lama, it was a couple of years ago, I think, he said, it was these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. And as we, as we well know, Buddha came through that remarkable tradition and then diverged in his own direction, in particular in relation to his own findings, experiential findings about the nature of self, you know. So the Buddha then is, is the person who, everything that is, is Buddhism, everything that is valid Buddhism, and we should check because there's a lot of rubbish published, especially in the West, I mean, because we don't have much respect for philosophical teachings, spiritual teachings. We tend to think we're all allowed to believe what we like, you know. So you, you go and do a weekend course and you get some kind of vision, then you write a book about it. And really people think that's valid and it's really very insulting. 
And again, we also know there are many levels of Buddhist teachings, different ways of interpreting. For example, I'm going to talk about karma tonight. And naturally, I'm going to talk about it from the perspective, from what I've learned in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, coming from the Gelug tradition in our tradition. And even among the Tibetans, there are different interpretations, not to mention different interpretations in Burma and Thailand, whatever. So, but we need to really to check and to listen. And if Buddhist teachings are, if these teachings we hear are authentic, then what that means is, it's, it's not just something to believe. That's a bit like, you know, there's something to, to, to look into and then to take on board as your hypothesis, that's what I like to say, and then to slowly through our life gradually put it into practice and gradually verify it for ourselves. Okay, it'll take time. It's not going to be overnight in this, in this maybe in one life we're going to realise all these teachings. But that's what Buddha is. He's a person who, from his own direct experience, came to the observation of, of, of the, the, the law of karma runs the universe, that our consciousness is not physical, that, we're, you know, that, that, that uh, reincarnation exists. This is not something that, you know, I joke and I say, it's not something made up by the hippies in the 60s. It's been around the Indi in India and this remarkable, amazing Indians for th thousands of years before the Buddha. You know? So many of these things are much older than the Buddha, these views. Clearly, Buddha's got his own take on them. But the, the approach to the teachings, therefore, isn't a question of merely believing. And we think that because we, we have this deep assumption that what is called spiritual teachings can't be proved. This is the commonest conception. Even though we as Buddhists know Buddha's not a creator, we don't join the dots. If, he's, if it's not coming from on high, these teachings aren't coming from some superior being on high who created everything. Then they're coming from the Buddha who was a regular guy like you and me, you know, who then from his own observation using these amazing techniques his Indians came up with, his remarkable single-pointed concentration that enables you to get this shamatha, this single-pointedness, which means accessing a subtle level of his own mind. He then was able to observe these things. He can observe the past, observe the future. This is, this is, part, this is within the realm of the capacity of the mind, according to the Buddha's view. It's a very different different view, you know. So the, the approach to it, the approach to it, and that's why I purposely like to say I take it as my working hypothesis. I think we get intellectually lazy, we say, oh yeah, I believe in karma, I believe in reincarnation, I believe in Buddha. Well, you know, if, for example, you wouldn't say, oh yeah, I believe in mathematics, people would laugh at you like an idiot. You don't believe in mathematics, you, put your, you, you, you squeeze your brain and you actually learn to learn mathematics so you verify it and prove it for yourself. That's the Buddha's approach. But of course, one step at a time. I mean, you can't prove relativity overnight. You've got to start with one plus one is two. It's the same approach though. And this is what I found very interesting. I, I notice all over the world, we all ask the same questions. It's very interesting, all humans in all the different cultures. But there's only one question I've ever heard once. And interestingly, it was a, it was a, it was a, a scientist in New Zealand and he said, who revealed the teachings to the Buddha? Which is a perfect question from the creator religion point of view. And, and I said, well, nobody. I said, he's like Einstein. He came, he came to his own, through his own observation, he came to see that everything that is called Buddhism is the way things are. And of course, he was very shocked because there's an assumption about spiritual teachings that we can't prove it. This is a deep assumption, even among Buddhists, you know, because we haven't joined the dots, we haven't looked properly into the teachings. But Buddha was a regular person who became this enlightened being. He actually transformed his own ordinary mind. He removed all the delusions from his mind. He removed all the kleshas. He, he literally removed them from his own mind but in, during this hard work that he says every single one of us can do. And that's the approach to take. So belief, belief is part of it. You know, if you go to the doctor and you've never studied medicine, you better believe your doctor. If they, but you should check first that they're valid. You don't go to your doctor because you've got a cute nose, you know. You go because you've heard they've got a good reputation. You don't have to go and do seven years of medicine just to, 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 to prove the doctor's right. If you've heard their reputation is good, then it's fine to go to the doctor. But if you're going to learn medicine yourself, you don't just blindly believe it. You learn it. You apply it. That's the approach to being a Buddhist. You've got to put your money where your mouth is, basically, you know. So how do we apply karma? Because this is one of the big things, and we all know it's a very popular word. We throw it around, you know. So what does it mean? Well, you know, the word karma, I think, I don't know Pali, but I suppose the Pali doesn't put an R in there, but I've heard if it's a Sanskrit, we, we spell it with an R, so karma, you know. But the Sanskrit word, anyway, so I don't know, I don't speak Sanskrit, but I've heard it means action. It means action, but the first step in it, the, the meaning is the word intention. This is the beginning of the entire process. When we look at the, the model of the mind, according to Buddhism, which is studied in all the traditions, it's, it's coming, you know, from, from all the traditions, it's, it's the same one, the, and which is coming in turn from the Hindus before, which of course variations, they've got, you've got these many different kinds of states of mind. You've got this neurotic, deluded kleshas, as they call in uh, Sanskrit, which is meaning 
afflictions or neurotic emotions, Buddha would have liked that phrase, or, you know, we, people often talk these days about, um, you know, um, well, I can't think of the word, poisons. We all know Lord Buddha talks about the three poisons. When people talk about these toxic emotions. Buddha would have liked that. It's a great word, toxic emotions. That's exactly what they are. And, and then we've got the positive qualities, the second category. The Buddha, con all the contents of our mind, as far as the Buddha's concerned, fit into these three categories. The toxic emotions, the neuroses, the kleshas, which the Buddha has found can be gotten rid of from this mind of ours. That's what the meaning of nirvana is, liberation. You've, you've, you've cut the root of all the nonsense. Then you've got the virtuous qualities, the positive qualities, which are there indestructibly. They are, they're at our core, if you like. Love, compassion, wisdom, kindness, joy, bliss, you name it. These are the virtuous ones. Then the third, the, the third category, and this is where intention fits, there's a whole bunch of these. I like to call these the mechanics of the mind, like concentration, good memory, discrimination. There's many of these, and these are developed in single point of concentration. So one of these is called intention, and it's there every second. That's the meaning of karma. Not in the sense of, oh, I have a good intention, but the literal one of volition, I will. That starts the entire process of this creating of karma. Even walking out that door, you know, if you see me stand up and walk down there, you can guarantee that I first had the thought, I will stand up and I will walk down there. My legs don't have their own brain, you know. Do you understand my point? So intention is always there, but we don't notice it 90% of the time because we're programmed. And we come programmed into this life with all these, and our negative ones very often. But intention is the boss, and that's the real meaning of the word karma, you could say. Mental action. It means action. Mental action. And then, of course, our body and our speech do the, do, do the wishes, don't they, of what's in the mind. Of course, we're not aware of this. This is why we're so crazy. Because we're, we're, we're very programmed, we come into this life programmed, and that's really very much the meaning of karma. You know, one way karma manifests is in a bunch of habits. So we come programmed with all these crazy habits, luckily some good habits too. And this is why, because the, the, the law of karma, as far as Buddha is concerned, this natural law, he did not make it up, he did not create it, he has observed it, he's observed that it's true, that it runs the show basically, we have to become in touch with it, we have to learn to live according to it. This is the crucial, this is the basis of being a Buddhist. The starting point of being a Buddhist, junior school, grade one, is as we all know, you know, Buddha exhorts us to not kill, not steal, not jump on the wrong person, not to lie, not to, you know, not to misuse our speech to harm sentient beings. He exhorts us as ten little things, we know. And this is where, again, the crucial difference. Jesus also tells us not to kill and lie, and the main reason is because God said. Buddha tells us not to lie. Why? Because it's a natural law, he says, because people don't like getting killed, people don't like getting lied to. But the crucial point for the Buddha, and this is the essence of the, of the this is the basis of Buddhist practice. Before we get any near, get anywhere near learning to meditate, get anywhere near learning to become familiar with our mind, Buddha exhorts us first to control our body and speech. And you have to ask the question, why? Not because he says so, not even because, you know, he doesn't, the, Negative action for the Buddha. Okay, negative action for Jesus is it's something that God said not to do. Negative action for the Buddha is an action that harms another. And this is the first level, killing, stealing. They harm other beings, you know. But the reason, the reason Buddha exhorts us not to do these things at the first stages of practice is because they will harm us. This is the crucial point to get. This is the crucial point to get. That when I kill, and I lie, and I steal, and I badmouth, and whatever. Yes, they are actions that harm others, but because of what goes on in my mind, and we'll talk about this, because of the motivation within my mind, because of what is in my mind, then that propels my body and speech, doesn't it, to do these actions that harm others. So therefore, I'm harming myself. Because Buddha's view, the, one of the fundamental ways of talking about karma, is that every, and this is a natural law for the Buddha, remember that, he didn't make it up. He doesn't do that, that's not his thing. He's observed it. The, 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 the most basic way of talking about karma, the most practical, ordinary psychological way is, the Buddha's point is, that every millisecond of what we think and therefore do and say kind of programs our mind. He would have liked that concept. Puts, so they use the analogy of seeds, sows seeds in our mind. Every millisecond of what happens in our mind then followed out, carried out by our body and speech. This is the process of quote unquote creating karma. And it's a process of sowing seeds in the mind. And these seeds eventually when they meet the right conditions in the future will ripen as our own experiences. So remember the Dalai Lama saying one time that karma is like self-creation and it's a really good way to put it. 
In other words, Buddha's not just being rude when he says there's no creator. He says we don't need creating. His whole view is so different. You know, as we know, he says our consciousness, our mind, our river of mental moments comes from before. And we come into our mother's womb programmed, actually, programmed with our various tendencies, with the seeds that will even produce our experiences at the hands of others. And even the way the very environment impacts upon us. And all this is dealt with in great depth in all the literature. It's all there for us to study. The technology of it is utterly fascinating, you know. So just some vague notion. And this is why, if we do want to be, say we're seriously Buddhists, you can't just say you believe in karma. It's not enough. That really is like saying you believe in botany. And it's okay to believe in botany. You can see that other people work with it. You can see that gardens do grow. But what if you have to grow one flower? You can't because you don't know the laws. You just like saying you believe in mathematics. But what if your mother says, go buy me five oranges? You can't do it because you don't know how to count. So believing in it is just not enough. You have to learn, you know, learn the words, the theories in the texts. They're all there from thousands of years, and there were Hindus before. They came up with it. They, served, they observed it. So it's, it's utterly fascinating, you know. So that, but we, we can get it right down to bare bones, though. Get down to the essence, to, to trying to make it experiential for us, and to try and, so that we can apply it as something that's kind of um, on the earth, not just some vague belief in the sky, you know. So, it, so the logic of the Buddha is this: if every millisecond of what we think and do and say leaves seeds in the mind, programs our mind, and therefore, and there's nothing that goes astray. So it's not just occasionally seeds are planted. As long as your mind is doing something at the subtlest level, even, as long as your body and speech are, are carrying out the wishes, they're like the servants of your mind, then we're constantly creating these endless, not just sets of rebirths, as we know in the Sutta, Lord Buddha talks about the 12 links of dependent arising. It's a way of describing how every moment of the day we're creating these countless, countless sets of rebirths. That's a major way that karma ripens in terms of the types of rebirth we get. But there's other ways it ripens as well. So to get it down to really down to practice, get it down to earth and recognize that if it is true that every moment of what I think and do and say sows seeds in my mind and will necessarily, if I, unless I pull the seeds out, obviously, and they will necessarily ripen in the future in four ways. We can put it down, put it this way, four ways. They'll ripen in four ways. One is our type of rebirth. As we all know, you know, no need to go into details tonight, but Lord Buddha would assert a whole range of types of sentient beings. It's interesting that the word in Tibetan for a sentient being, the English term, is a semchen, a mind possessor, a mind possessor, consciousness, mind. And there are, we know there are countless sentient beings. So one, the first way that our karma ripens, the seeds, and this happens at the time of death. This happens at the time of death, and certainly in the Vajrayana teachings, uh, there are these detailed descriptions of the process itself, the death process, and exactly when the karmic seeds are triggered. And according to that system, it's uh, sort of a few, it's not long before we stop breathing, when this particular process starts, and the karmic seeds are triggered at the time of our death that will determine our future rebirth. And that was probably not more than a few weeks before we came running to our mummy's womb, you know, when she hopped into bed with our daddy, or wherever she hopped. You understand? So it's probably a few weeks before that, the karmic seeds, one that would, that would be triggered, which would be one of your main karmic seeds, which is the one that, in our case, created the cause for us to find a mother's human womb. It wasn't just some random event. It was, it was determined even before we stopped breathing in the past life, seems according to this system. Second, and I'm sure it's just variations in the different traditions, you know? But second, the, the, the next set of karmic seeds that were triggered at the same time, before we stopped breathing in the past life, were all the ones that would determine our own personality. And this is why it's crucial to understand this. Because um, according to the materialist philosophical model, we know that mummy and daddy give us anger and love and compassion and psychosis and, and, and being good at football or music. Not for the Buddha. These, our own personality was triggered, the seeds for them were triggered before we even left the past body, you know? Mummy and Daddy haven't even hopped into bed yet. So the second way our karma ripens, we can call these the actions or the intentions similar to the cause, your personality traits. And we can all see since we're tiny. My mother did not have to teach me anger, believe me. I had it down. It was there as a tendency, believe me. I knew how to do it very, very well. And we can see ourselves. We've got tendency to like football or music or to steal or lie. Look at the world, you know. And look at our own personalities. These were already triggered before we even stopped breathing. And they're a the bunch of our, they're like the, the tendencies, all our tendencies. This is our personality. 
number two. Number three, they're called experiences similar to the cause. And these are all the, basically the way we're seen and treated by others. Speaking simply, if you think of your life up to now from the time you're born, we, we're very social beings, aren't we? We bump into lots of sentient beings. Humans, dogs, rats, cockroaches, you know, who do their business in your spoon drawer. There's all these sentient beings we meet, right? Well, the Buddha says this law of karma, by the way, is natural. No one runs it. It's not, therefore, it's not random. Anything that's na a natural law, once you've learned the law, we know it, it works every time. Botany is a natural law. Mathematics is a natural law. Well, karma is a natural law in exactly the same way. And this is shocking to our ears because we can't help but hear it as religion, you know? It's exactly the same. And the Buddha and anybody since that time, any beings who become Arya beings, you know, uh, uh, holy beings, um, they, the, the Arhants, they've also observed this. This is the point. Our mind has that capacity. When we've got single point of concentration, one of the, the qualificate, one of the qualities we achieve is clairvoyance. That's when we'll prove that this is true. And this practice is coming before the Indians, they, before the Buddha, this single point of concentration, this, this system to, to achieve shamatha, you know, it's been around for thousands of years. And when we access our subtle mind, that's when we can prove this is true, because clairvoyance is one of the consequences of, it, of, um, of achieving this single-pointedness. So this has been observed by beings in the past, you know. So then all these, it's a natural law that just runs our lives, or our lives run within this natural law, if you like. So this third way our karma ripens, our experiences at the hands of others. So like I said, since we're born, you can think you've got people either who've been mean to you, including the rats, or those who've been kind to you, and they often change roles, don't they? You know, your husband leaves you for a younger version. Your sister gives you up. But we can see that our, the, our, work, our, li our lives consist of, we're very social, of beings and how they see us and how they treat us. This is the third way that our karma has, has ripened. In other words, this very strong relationship, we've got this history with each other. It's not random. It can't be random. You just meet a person randomly. It's impossible. If it's a natural law, it's impossible. So we, whoever we meet, however they treat us, how they see us, what they do, they lie to us, steal from us, don't believe our words, do believe our words, give us credit, don't give us credit, whatever. This is called experiences similar to the cause. And the fourth one's even called environmental karma, the very way the physical world impacts upon us. So what else is it? The very physical world you live in, the, all the beings in the world, how they treat you and see you, your own personality traits and your own humanity itself. Well, what else is there in our life? And main cause of all these four, our past actions. We, Dalai Lama's not joking when he calls it like self-creation. It's like literally true. Not in a magic wand sense, but in an evolutionary sense. Or in the same sense that you know, if you, you know, you're, you're, practice, you're playing the piano and I go, wow, why are you so good at piano? Well, Rabin, I have practiced for 10 years. What do, you, what do you expect? I mean, that's called karma. It's habit, you know. You practice it and you get good at it. Get what? Guess what? But this is, the, this is the Buddha's view. So our own personality, whatever we're good at, lying, stealing, music, football, you name it. Being kind, being loving, being patient, not killing, killing, whatever, you know. Habits from the past. Habits from the past. And we get programmed with this and we come fully programmed at the first, at the first moment of conception. This is rad we can see this is radically different from the Christian teaching and it's radically different from the philosophical materialist view. Very different view. So even understanding these four ways that karma ripens, then you can interpret your life every day. But what's also, the, so the next thing about karma is it's what's so fascinating. We tend to hear it as, as like, um, excuse me. We, we tend to only apply it when it comes to the bad things. You know, I, I said before there's only one question I've ever had. Well, there's one question I've never had. I've never yet had a person ask me, Rabina, why do good things happen? Because we only, somehow, and this is very fascinating. I think this really gets us to look into the deep assumption that attachment is, that craving is. It's this deep assumption that somehow we think we deserve good things. So when the good things happen, we just greedily want more. We don't go, wow, amazing, look at these good things happening. Just give me more, please. Because I think we assume we deserve them. But when bad things happen, panic attack, isn't it? We really do believe we don't deserve. It's very fascinating, this. It's deep in our bones. No one taught us this. It's a deep assumption. And I think if we look into our minds deeply, which is what we should be doing if we're Buddhists, the assumptions of aversion and attachment are these. The assumption of attachment especially runs the show, you know. It's effectively the main cause of our day-to-day -day suffering, according to Lord Buddha and his Four Noble Truths. And what attachment is is multifaceted. But there's this basic, this deep, cr frantic craving to only get the nice things. 
nice smell, nice sound, nice taste, nice praise, nice things, nice weather. So because it's such a deep assumption, we take it for granted. We're not amazed and delighted every day someone's kind to us. But the moment a bad thing happens, absolute panic attack, freak out. And this is the source of most of our suffering on this planet because we, we assume we don't deserve. It's very fascinating. But what we're really saying probably is we can't stand the bad things happening, which is aversion and anger, and we just love the good things. Give me more, please, you know. So we don't really question these assumptions, and that's exactly what the Lord Buddha is demanding we do by knowing our minds, unpacking and unraveling the contents and looking into these deep assumptions we have, these kleshas, these, these toxic emotions we have, you know. But as a superficial level, a very deep level. So basically the Buddha is saying then, to, just to bring it, so generally speaking, as I said, everything we think and do and say will produce fruits, will produce our experiences. We are the creators of our future, guaranteed. That's the way Buddha says it. So narrow it down a little bit more, and this gets down to the nitty gritty now, that so-called negative actions of body, speech and mind will produce suffering. So-called positive actions of body, speech and mind will produce happiness. That's the fundamentals of the law, and that's the basis of practice. Once we get this down, then we know how to practice Dharma. Then we know how to practice at the first level, junior school level, control your body and speech. Remember, there's no discussion of meditation yet. That's more advanced, you know. We've got to first control, subdue this crazy, harness the energy of this crazy body, speech and mind, this body, speech of ours. When we can begin to harness the energy of our body and speech, which is what we do in living in precepts, precepts are mainly about the body and speech, not about the mind, the harnessing our body and speech, disciplining our body and speech, refraining from, from, from doing actions that are negative, at the very minimum, then gives us the space, the miracle of space, to now be able to really practice meditation and to really start to, to, to change the mind, which is the root of the problem. This is more advanced, though. So we've got to do both, of course. So the very first level of practice, Buddha exhorts us, don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat on partners, don't, don't lie, four of the speech, don't lie, don't badmouth people behind their backs. Don't use abusive language and don't just rabbit on about nothing. Seven little things. He then gets us to look and to begin to control the grosser levels of the three poisons, you know, the three toxic emotions, the wrong views, attachment and craving, uh, attachment and anger. So it's the begin this is the beginnings, but this is the basis of all our practice, no matter how advanced we are. This is the starting point, but it never ends, you know. So the reason first, we have to hear this, we have to hear this. The reason, the motivation, the reason Buddha exhausts us not to kill, not to lie, not to steal, is he says, because that will sow seeds in your mind, Rabina, that if you leave them there, will ripen in the future as your suffering. So for example, if it's killing, the four results of killing would be the type of rebirth would be the lower realms, an animal, in one, a, a spirit, or in the hell realms. As you know, Buddha asserts these different realms of existence. And it's all, again, all there in the literature. And it's for us to think about it, you know. Second, the, the killing would ripen as a tendency. You wake up in this life, you know, as, with a tendency to kill. No one has to teach you. I always use the example of a friend of mine came to me years ago crying when she'd heard karma for the first time. And she's not a Buddhist now, but she talked about it. And she, her boy, she said, from the time he was tiny, as soon as he met fishing, he like fell in love with fishing because he's got the karmic tendency to kill. He meets the fishing, it looks gorgeous, he doesn't question it, so he spends his life fishing. And then he died young, scuba diving, you know. And then equally at the same time, the reverse one, if you're born with a tendency to not kill, another example I always tell, a friend of mine in Queensland, her little boy, he's like 40 now, but when he was three, there she is taking the lice out of his head. And he's crying with compassion for the lice. Mommy, mommy, leave them alone. Don't hurt them, it's their home. And he's 40 something now and has never killed a living being. So we can deduce that he's lived in vows of, of non-killing from the past, such that he got born in this life, not only as a human, but with a tendency not to kill. That's a miracle. Look on this planet, you know, this is a tragedy. Seven billion, seven billion humans, they won the lottery, basically, if you like. So much virtue that they got a human body, but the tragedy is the residual result of past killing, because it wasn't fully purified, was they wake up in this life with a tendency to kill. And with respect, even most religions say it's okay to kill. I mean, I was born as a Catholic, I have great respect, but I was taught that God made all the animals for our benefit. They don't have souls, and it's okay to kill them. So it's a, Buddha's view is very, very different. We can see this, you know. And look at the humans, and that's the tragedy. You got born in this life, you got the human birth, 
But then you've got a tendency to kill, you don't question it, it's a deep habit, and the world approves of it. Well, it depends on who you kill. Like this boy killed fish, and that's approved of in America. In America, I met this boy, the mother. But imagine if he wanted to kill poodles. He would have been in serious trouble. He had to go out and sneak out at night to kill his poodles. But he was, able, he was allowed to kill fish because the world doesn't mind, you know, which is the, the irony of it because it was so, so it's just, you know, that's the tragedy because no one, no one taught him not to kill fish. And then, of course, back to the lower realms as a result because that killing is the main thing that predominated dominated his life, you know. This is a tragedy. The third way killing ripens, the experience similar to the cause, would you, you be get, you'd get killed or you'd die young. Well, look at this planet. Look at just the humans, forget the animals. Look at the humans, you know, who get born, who, who, who die as babies. Often, no medical reason, we'll say. Or the people who get killed. Either you die, in, you look at the ones who even live in, the, who get, get a human birth, but die as a fetus. I think if you did your research, you're probably going to find more humans die before they're born than those who even who get born. Think about it, meaning a fetus, you know. That's due to their karma of killing. So the experience similar to the cause of having killed in the past is that you will get killed or you will die young. Well, here we are, aren't we fortunate, we're still breathing, you know. Our, karma, our petrol tank hasn't run out yet. And the fourth way, excuse me, my cold. The fourth way, the environmental result of, of killing, is that the, the, very, the very physical environment, I'm so sorry, so rude. <laughs> I've got a tissue here, but I know, but whatever. <laughs> um, the, the physical world, the very physical world that should nourish us, like air, water, food, would harm you. So environmental illnesses. Look at entire environments. You can see the collective karma of entire environments totally polluted. Or it can be individual karma. You know, you've you got allergies to peanuts. This is called environmental karma. That's the fruit of killing. So, of course, you extrapolate and you reverse that. And you can see the, res the results of non-killing. And we can see how fortunate we are. We've got a human birth. That's the result of non-killing. Second, aren't we fortunate? Maybe we did kill once. We maybe, as now Buddhists, we've decided we've lived in the, we're now living in precepts of not killing. And that's pretty amazing. And I'll talk about the power of that. The power of vows. Buddha loves his vows, you know. And this is a really powerful way to abide by the laws of karma, a very easy way. I'll explain. The third one, look at us, we're still alive. We haven't been killed yet and we're not dead yet. Well, that's because our third way, our karma of non-killing is so far still ripening. The experience similar to the, the cause of past non-killing. And maybe we, we get good, good food and the water here in Melbourne's pretty good. I mean, when I come back to Australia, it's like a miracle. This place is so blessed, you know, environmentally even that the food is nourishing, that the water's pol not polluted, so just coming out of taps. Some countries you'd die if you drank water out of taps. This is all the result of our past virtue. And this is what I'm saying, we take this stuff for granted. If we really did understand karma, and we really applied it every day, we'd be, we'd be just joyful every day and realise not to, we, then we'd not just be happy, aren't we lucky? No, not luck. It's like you're looking in a whole veggie garden. You will never forget that those vegetables are the fruit of your hard work. And that's what we don't do. We forget that what we are and what our life is is the fruit of our own past virtue. We're not talking about nirvana here. We're talking about the basic level. At least we'll get another decent human birth, you know. This is the cause of another decent human body. And the conditions that we've got now are why we're able to sit in this hall right now, as opposed to being out there having to go, get, you know, work 18 hours for a bowl of rice. Because of our virtuous karma, how incredible, how fortunate we are. So that when we just understand that everything that we're experiencing, not just the bad stuff, is the fruit of our past actions, then we will delight every day. And then, of course, like with your veggies, when you look at your veggie garden, you never forget that that's the fruit of your hard work. You don't just start taking it for granted and greedily eating all your veggies, forgetting to plant more. That would be really stupid, wouldn't it? And then complain because there are no more veggies left, like as if someone else should plant them for you. No, it's your garden. And that's why I like to use the seeds and fruits analogy, which, which Buddha uses, is a really excellent one. So if you think of your life, is, is really your garden, what's in it, what you experience every day, how you're seen by others, how you're treated, people mean to you, people kind to you, good things, bad things happening. Every second it becomes very dynamic. You don't rave on about it, but it, it, it informs the way you interpret your life. Then it informs your actions, which is the final point. You, what's in your garden now is a fruit of what you've done before, so then it informs what you have to keep putting in your garden virtuous karmic seeds and you've got to do your weeding pull out the pull out the negative seeds it's a very practical approach you know 
It's not the way the world thinks. And even when we're good Buddhists, we don't think about it. We always complain and, and blame everybody else and blame the mean people. And Because we forget the, the view of karma is that we created this reality for ourselves, you know. We're the boss. Buddha's not the boss, he's just this kind advisor who's done this job and, and, and shows us the way to become like he be, what he became. But this is the basic way to understand karma, nothing fancy, you know. Everything you experience is a fruit of your past actions. You can divide it into the way the environment impacts upon you, sentient beings, how they treat and see you, your own tendencies and your own humanity. So then, once you understand you want, and even, forget, again, forget nirvana, you know, don't get too high yet, please, keep it on the earth. Aim for that, no question. But within that fact, we have to at least recognize this fundamental thing, and all Lord Buddha's teachings really are based upon this simple observation that all beings want to be happy, all beings don't want suffering. Well, the, the Lord Buddha's view of karma is, is exactly that. It's his method for how to get happiness and how to stop suffering. And we're just talking at the basic level. Good enough. At least if we die with some virtue in our minds, living in vows, we'll, we'll get another decent human rebirth and keep on bopping and keep on practicing and eventually we'll get, achieve our nirvana, you know? Aim for that, no question. It's practical, it's so practical. Don't hear it as holy, don't hear it as merely belief. It's practical and doable. And if we're not d treating it this way, we're just treating it as superstition. It's like insulting ourselves, really. Buddha doesn't mind. It's just, you know, but it's ourselves that are the, are the, uh, uh, end up not getting the benefits, you know. And it's a dynamic view. Every single second of the day, and if you analyse your day, you can divide it into happy experiences and unhappy ones. Forget the neutral. They're called neutral experiences. Forget them. We know this. Throughout the day, if you tracked your day internally, not externally, you'd have, you know, wake up in the morning, fairly happy, 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 then a few things go wrong, unhappy, unhappy, happy, 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 ha unhappy, unhappy. That's it. Throughout the day, it's either experiences of happiness or suffering, or, or to whatever degree. Well, all the ones that are called suffering are the fruit of your past negative actions, and all the ones that are called happiness are the fruit of your virtuous actions. Do you want happiness? Yep. Well, then create the causes. Do you want suffering? Nope. Then stop creating the causes. It's so practical, you know. It's like botany. It really is. But we've got to hear it like this and apply it this way. And that at least then gives us the causes and, gives us, and makes us feel we are in charge of our life, because that's a big shock to us. We might hear these views about karma, that there's no creator, but we still have a strong feeling that somehow, oh, I'm sure someone will see I'm a good girl and I'll get a good rebirth, you know. So, no, you've got to cause it, honey, I'm sorry. You've got to create the causes. It's not Buddha's job, you know. It's not his job at all. It's nobody's job. It's yours to know what kind of rebirth you want. So you can keep on practicing. You can keep on practicing. So you can eventually get rid of suffering altogether, you know. Are we communicating? <laughs> I think now you have to ask me some questions. Come on, are go you, open Are it up you now. saying that Buddha said that if we kill in this life, we're going to end up a dog in the next life? Well, at least a dog, if not worse. Yeah, absolutely. So how are we ever going to be, uh, go back to being a person? Well, you just dogs have to stop, kill. Stop, ki stop killing, baby. But dogs kill. Yeah, but you make sure you don't get born a dog. That's the point. You, just don't, you don't create the cause. So that's like in, in the Catholic religion that you're going to end up in hell. No, it's not, because someone sends you there. No one sends you. Okay, that's a bit like saying, no, I hear your point, but this is how we hear karma, you see. If you go to the doctor and she says to you, what's your name? Uh, Eva. Eva. She, she advises you, Eva, darling, I think you better not smoke because you, you might get cancer. That's possible, isn't it? She might do that, mightn't yeah. she? Now, you won't say, who do you think you are? How dare you tell me that if I smoke, you'll give me cancer? You don't say that, do you? You don't say that, do you? Let me follow me through, follow yeah. me through. You don't say that because you know that she's, she's not a punisher. She's not giving you cancer, but she's advising you of the natural law that smoking could cause you to get cancer. Can you hear that? Yes. And so you'd thank her for her kindness, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Thank her for warning you and giving you advice, wouldn't well, you? Maybe. <laughs> what do you mean, maybe? Well, my son would, wouldn't. But what, I'd, darling? My son wouldn't, but I'd say yes. Okay. You know what I'm saying, though? Yes. So then, secondly, you wouldn't go home and you notice your doctor's not there, so out come the Marlboros. Oh, I won't get cancer. She doesn't see me. You wouldn't say that either. You'd, you'd, you'd be laughed at if you did that. Would you agree with that? Yes. Because you know that it's a natural law that smoking could cause you to get cancer. You accept that? So therefore, it's not punishment, is it? Would you agree with that? No. I think it's punishment. Who's punishing you? Well, I have to tell you, I'm really... No, darling, you've got to follow through with logic. I this... am, but no, I'm you're really not. You've got to no, you, no, no, really I've got to... disappointed that... No, you're not listening. You got not... Eva, you're just coming, you keep going back to it. You've got to follow this through and use your noggin. Buddha is either speaking a load of rubbish or he's speaking something that's valid. So 
just relax, have an open mind and try and hear the point I'm trying to make here. Because you're not hearing it right. You want to keep going back to the same point. It's just like the Catholicism. Can, I, can we continue this discussion, please? Yes. Thank you, sweetheart. Very good. OK, good. So you agree so far with what I've said? That smoking, is, it, it could cause your body to get cancer. If you eat too much sugar, it could cause your body to get diabetes. Do we accept that as, yes. a, as a natural law? Yes. And we accept that it's not punishment and it's not reward. Do you accept that? And the doctor is an advisor. Can you yes. hear that? Yes. Okay, that is the position of the Buddha. He is not a creator. He does not punish. He does not reward. That's laughable for him. What he is telling us, in the same way that a doctor can observe your body, that consequences could come from certain actions, the Buddha has observed more subtly because they can access more subtle levels of his mind. And we can all do that with this single point of concentration meditation that thousands of people for thousands of years have been practicing, that you, they've observed that the suffering is not the fruit of punishment of a creator, which is the Catholic teaching, but it is the result of our own actions. And that your happiness, Eva, everything that's happened to you in your life that's good, all the good things, your humanity, the people who are kind to you, your own good qualities, the fact that you sit in a room like this as opposed to a gun club, all of this is the fruit of your past unbelievable hard spiritual work. You are the creator of yourself, sweetheart. So how many times do I have to keep coming back? As, as, much, as, as much as you work on it, as, as quick as you get out of it. It's up to you, sweetheart. You're the boss. That's the Buddha's view. Can you hear it, darling? Of course I, you can. You're an intelligent person. But you just don't like it, that's all. You just don't like it. No, I don't. I know that, but who cares if you like it? It's either true or it's not. We have to be brave. We're big girls and boys, you know. <laughs> I mean, Buddha, he's telling us what he's observed. He's either a load of rubbish. You know, you've got to start somewhere with something, you know. You don't have to. But we're big, we are big girls and boys, and we can if we're interested. OK, not everybody who's a Buddhist is interested in this stuff. Many people just do their mindfulness and couldn't care less about karma. I happen to like the big picture, and I'm happy to talk about it. I don't mind, you know, because I'm going to find out one day if he's right or he's wrong. I'm not in a hurry. I'm, I'm sorry, that's why I say when I take it all my working hypothesis, I'm prepared to take the whole big deal on board. But I know I'm the boss. I know Buddha's not the boss. It's not punishment. It's not reward. It's up to me. That I find very empowering. I enjoy it. And I'm enjoying my time with the Buddha. And if I find him out to be wrong, then fine. I've had a good time until then. Are you hearing me, girl? Are you seeing I'm, not, I'm cracking jokes about it? I'm not miserable about it. Do you understand? Good, darling. Anybody else want to argue with me? <laughs> Come here. Over here. No, no. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. being here tonight. I... I have a question, in, I, maybe karma-wise. I don't understand, as a mother, um, how to let go when my children have a problem. OK, darling. That's to do with the mind. That's to do with attachment. OK, so let's look at attachment, shall we? The law of karma is this nuts and bolts of how things happen, according to the Buddha's own observation. Okay? And then, but what creates karma is the mind. So we have to then learn about the mind. So you learn the Buddhist model of the mind. Like I said before, you've got these three categories of states of mind, all the, all the, 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 the toxic emotions, Buddha would have loved that phrase, you know, the poisons, as he calls them, the unhappy states of mind, the painful, the attachment, the anger, the jealousy, the fears. And not to hear this in a guilty way. Buddha's not being moralistic. He wants us to have compassion for ourselves when we hear this, because he's telling us this is why we suffer, you know. So effectively, among all those, he says effectively in the Four Noble Truths that attachment is the main source of suffering. And it's hard to hear this because we don't even know what he means by it. So let's just look at what he says it is, not what we mean it is. We have a different definition, OK? But the second category, you've got your virtues, your goodness, your qualities, your, your kindness, your compassion, your intelligence, uh, along with your, with your children, you know? Do you understand? You've got, but these, the trouble is our virtues, which are our saving grace, they are polluted by the rubbish. They're polluted by all the poisons. You understand? They, and, they, and especially attachment, and especially when it comes to close relationships like parent to child, you know. The, the third category, like I said, are like the, the nuts, the, the sort of the mechanics of our mind. Forget those now. OK, so attachment then is, if it's, if it's the main source of our suffering, and that seems such a shock to us to hear, what he's meaning by it, it's, really, it's multifaceted, OK? So due to practicing it in the past, he says we come programmed in this life 
And the deepest energetic level of attachment is this terrible feeling of dissatisfaction. Never have enough. Never got enough. What I get is not enough. What I, how much you tell me you love me? Not enough. What I achieve? Not enough. How big my breasts are? Not enough. How big my body is? Not, nothing is ever enough. The, it's like the, half glass, the glass half full. This is this painful experience of always being dissatisfied. On the basis of this dissatisfaction, we then naturally hanker after something, the next level of it, for something that would naturally we think is missing. And the first level is the, is the objects of the senses. And that includes people. So that's a more powerful object, isn't it? People. So another aspect of attachment is, and this is certainly with mothers, they ex attachment exaggerates hugely the deliciousness of the object. So you're, you know, so there's, there's also love and compassion there, clearly. If you only, if you only had attachment for your child, then it wouldn't last, you know, you'd just, if, as soon as they stopped doing what you wanted, you'd, you know, you'd kill them or something. So luckily you've got love and compassion, which tempers your attachment, do you understand? But the attachment is really a massive drive, because essentially you could say really, it sounds quite brutal, but this is the essence of what attachment is, it's this frantic neediness in us, very subtle, continuously there, under everything. It's a frantic neediness, a frantic craving to get what I want every second or to get only the nice things. So when it comes to a child, that means you want them to do what you want. Equally, if you see them suffering, you only want them to be happy. Attachment can't bear to see their suffering. Your compassion is there too, but attachment, you see, is this junkie that only wants the nice things. It wants the nice smell, the nice taste, the nice weather, everything to be lovely and hunky-dory. You understand? It can't stand problems. So if you see your child suffering, because you've also got compassion, it's unbearable to you. Do you understand? It's unbearable. So, and when we see even suffering in the world, forget about it. It's unbearable because really, you don't have, you don't suffer because you've got compassion. You don't suffer because you see suffering in the world. You have compassion. That doesn't cause you suffering. It's attachment that can't stand to see the problems is why we're suffering. So, it's attachment that pollutes our compassion and pollutes our love, and we almost don't even distinguish the difference. And so, it's not an easy job. And that's what we mean by letting go. It's very, it's the hardest job we've got. But so we have to learn to distinguish in our minds what we have to learn to meditate. We have to identify the energy of the craving, the neediness, and, and distinguish it from the energy of love and empathy, which is connected to others and is valid. So in an ordinary yeah. world. Hello, Rabina. I'm yes. a bit nervous by the question. Okay, go on, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's practical advice. But we as understand. Well. I mean, oh, we yes. understand. She knows I'm yes. being kind. Yes. Um, it's sort of similar in oh God, regard. Oh No, no, no. <laughs> it's in regard with relationships. Okay. And so husbands then same uh, problem. Okay. No, just people that you that you love but you don't always agree with. And so. So what's the question? Come to the question. The question is, um, how do you stop yourself arguing? Okay. Okay, when we understand, could, when I said about attachment so far, you kind of recognise it. Oh, yes, I did. Constant dissatisfaction. Yes. Or, but essentially, to be brutal, the essence of attachment is this frantic craving to get what I want every damn second. That's it. And another way to put it is it only, attachment only wants the nice things, which means what I want. Yeah. Everything to be the way I want. It sounds brutal, but it really is the way it is. Oh, but because I it's tempered it. by our kindness and our sweet voice and our lovely actions, we don't even see it ourselves. Do you understand? It's so sneaky. It's like a honey covered razor blade. Yeah. So that's oh. the problem. Now, <laughs> listen to this. When a attachment doesn't get what it wants, and that's a thousand times a day, that's the arising of the next of these toxic emotions, and it's called aversion. And it's got a whole spectrum, honey. The grosser, obvious level of aversion is simply called anger. Anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants, and it's a thousand times a day, and it's often a very subtle level. But there's my, so there's a whole spectrum of anger, of aversion. The bare bones is aversion. The bare bones energy is attachment and aversion, okay? Attachment's, ooh, 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 that's lovely, and you go towards it. Aversion is, ooh, ooh, that's ugly, and you go away from it. And, and then they've got these vast, this spectrum of expressions of these emotions, you understand? Mm -hmm. So the, the volatile expression of aversion is plain old anger, shout and yell, fight. You understand? Then you've got milder versions of aversion, and we don't even notice these and don't even pay attention. They're called irritated, upset, annoyed, frustrated. Do you understand? As soon as you get annoyed, that means your attachment just didn't get what he wanted. But we don't hardly even pay attention to that. Then you've got the, the internalised versions, which is depression and despair. 
These are the spectrum of thwarted attachment. And I'm talking at quite subtle levels here. These are deep energetic levels, not just, oh, I like chocolate cake, oh, I don't like chocolate cake. That's a gross, gross level of attachment and aversion. It's way more subtle. And we only start to really notice these as we get deeper and deeper into our own minds. And they're really very... So the essence of it is attachment and aversion. It sounds so kind of cute and boring, but it's really profound. So the answer is you've got to watch your... Okay, first answer, as Buddha would do, control your speech first. Oh, and I know, and that's That's my the first one. Problem. I tell you, this we can yeah. spend the rest of the day just praising the benefit of bloody or closing your mouth. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> zipping the lip. I can't describe the power of that because we are so uncontrolled with our mouth. We mightn't go around raping and killing too many people, but we really think there's no, there's no problem with blurting out everything we feel every second. And this is so much of our problems. We know this. So even if your anger's burning in there, at least you control your speech. And that takes great courage. And that's why we need vows. And I'll just discuss these before we finish. We so that's, the f that's not a joke. Let me tell you, my family, there's seven of us, seven siblings, one brother, six sisters. He's the youngest. We're all volatile like me. So we're very close in age as well. So since we're tiny, we used to fight, naturally. Then we got older, we'd come back for Christmas, you'd fight, naturally. And then I talked to Polly on the phone and she complains about Janet and Julie says about Polly and do you understand? Naturally, in families. But the la we're all old now. So I would say the last 20 years, and a couple of us especially have really kind of led the way and we've all picked it up. And they're all good people, all good human beings helping each other, you know, helping the world, not spiritual per se. But I would say the last 20 years, we now have this conscious, unsp well, unspoken agreement between us never to speak th about things when we're together that we don't agree with and, 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 and to never criticise each other behind our backs. And we, we do it pretty much all the time. And the difference is quite phenomenal because there's genuine harmony between us now. There's no burdens and the horrible things you've regretted and those words you said and the tears and the, and the, and the, there's none of that anymore and it's really quite remarkable to see it. I really stress it. But this is huge and it's got to be, but you mightn't have to have an agreement with somebody. You've got to do it. You can't stop other people. But I can see with us, we've influenced each other because they're all good people, basically. Really good, good ethics, you know. The difference is phenomenal. We, there's a genuine affection between us now and we're very, very different. Most of my sisters couldn't care less about Buddhism. They never asked, in 40 years, they never asked me any questions, you know. But they just love me for who I am and I never talk about it. Speech is incredibly powerful. I tell you, speech is so powerful. And when you control your speech, then you calm your mind down. I mean, this is why we're so weird in our world. We sort of think, oh, I'm allowed to say what I like, like as if it has no effect. But can you imagine, there you are sitting at home all day and no one else is there, and you rave on all day, shouting at the television, shouting at your iPad, shouting at the newspaper. Do you understand? By the end of the day, who's, who have you harmed? You. It's so evident, you know. But we just don't get this. Because we think, oh, I'm allowed to say what I like. We think I'm allowed to think what I like, like some precious world in here. But every single thing we think and do and say, Buddha says, counts. It's producing you. So thinking it this way, you've got to ask, why would you want to produce an angry, miserable person? Forget the harm you do to other people, even. This is a powerful point that Buddha makes with karma. It's for our own sake. Oh, do you understand I've, me, darling? Oh, yes, and I've This is the main one. It. But make a, you know the people you're going to have talks with, yeah. so make a vow to yourself, and you have to talk about it to other people. I will shut my mouth, you know. <laughs> I will not say the words. <laughs> And then you get, you get brave after that. You get brave. And then you don't talk about them behind their back. That's the other one not to do. Because yeah. that keeps it burning. I'm better at you that. You do not talk about them behind their backs. If we can do this, I mean, you see it in Buddhist centers, there's disharmony. Everywhere you turn, it's humans, behind backs especially. It's, that's the heaviest one. Mm. And it's, not, it's so easy. It's, I mean, forget meditating. I'm going to discuss meditating here. Just control your speech, you know. <laughs> do you understand? Yes. Thank you. This is the answer, darling. Yeah. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it se seems like, um, from what you were saying, uh, killing obviously is having a very bad repercussions. So personal story, I guess we all were sharing personal stories, so I don't mind. And, well, uh, you, is there a reason to want to tell me yes, your story? Yes, the reason There's is a that, question at the end? Uh, yes, I was involved in research uh, which involved killing animals, and yes. with time I realized that it's not going to really lead to any cures. Wonderful, yeah. Uh, started having nightmares about it and so on and so forth, I decided to abandon this Good, career. Good, wonderful, yes. Uh, but uh, then I'm thinking to myself, that has already been done. Yes, exactly, I understand. So what can I do now okay, to help I myself? Yes, well, okay, good, very practical, excellent question. I don't, know what, I, don't know what, I don't know what you call it in your tradition, but we call it purification in our tradition. And we have a very particular practice that, that we call the four R's. 
So remembering everything we think and do and say sows seeds and brings results. So then purification is just another way of, of bringing good results. You know, that's all. So it's like, it's like pulling out the weeds, basically. So the very first level of practice is at least stop what you've done. The first level of practice, immediate, is stop killing. The second one is now you've got to start taking care of the seeds you've already planted, which is your question, that from the past killing. And that's, called, that's the weeding job. So we call it purification. And it's a very practical practice. I know Lama Zopa, our teacher, he says it's like we're insane not to do this practice every day. And there's very formal ways of doing it. But also it's very, it can be very ordinary. This is what part of our problem, I think, with practice. We make it all so holy in the sky, you know, we say things with holy voices, and it just, it's ridiculous. It doesn't become real. And because Buddha is a brilliant psychologist, and I'm not joking when I say that, he didn't use the word psychology because he didn't speak Greek, for God's sake. But it is simply his, his, his expertise is the mind. He's an absolute genius when it comes to the mind. Do you understand? And so the first step is regret. And that's very specific, and that's a bit similar to what we've just talked now. And that's not guilt. Remember the Dalai Lama asked, was asked one time, what's the difference between this regret and what we know as guilt? So guilt, he said, it's so simple. He said, guilt, you look in the past and you go, oh, I did all this killing, I did that, I killed these people, I killed these beings. Uh, then you go, and I'm a bad person. That's our usual, the irony of, 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 of ego is we run to that blame. And that's just anger. Like if I say to you, you did this and you did that and you're a bad person, that's called anger. Well, I did this and I did that and I'm a bad person. That's called guilt and it's internalised anger. And it's a delusion, it's ridiculous, it's nonsense. It's not helpful. But with regret, as His Holiness said, the first point's the same. Yes, I did kill those creatures. Yes, I did. And then the second one is, instead of, oh, I'm a bad person, you say, what can I do about it? So, okay, the regret then is, so the regret is, partic is especially for your sake. We're not looking at compassion yet for the sentient beings we've harmed. That comes second. You've, and this is really just applying the laws of karma. You recognise that you killed, which means out of your own ignorance, and this is the point. I mean, I had an abortion when I was 23. I was using one example. I didn't kill many creatures. You probably killed millions, right? Little baby ones, were they? Or big fat ones? No, once they developed cancer. So what kind of bugs, were you, what kind of creatures were you killing? I don't know, uh, mice. Oh, mice. How mice many? Millions or thousands? <laughs> I'm just interested. It's all right. How many? Hundreds, hundreds. Only hundreds, not millions. Oh, he's, oh, he's only a baby killer, come on. <laughs> I mean, whales, whales, one mouthful of one breakfast for one whale, 40 million beings go in. So you, whales leave you for dead, babe, don't worry about it. <laughs> anyway, sweetheart. So regret is, this is how I think about my abortion, you know. I did it out of ignorance. I didn't think it was a human being in there. I just knew I didn't want what would come out the other end. That's all I knew. I didn't want what would come out the other end, which was a human being. So I thought, I'm going to kill it. Don't even say that. I'm going to have an abortion, you know. So out of ignorance, I say, I regret. Out of ignorance. And why do I regret? I say to myself when I do this practice, I say to myself, why do I regret it? You say to yourself, because you know what, Rabina, I don't want those seeds to ripen in the future as my suffering. Not to mention being born in the lower realms, not to mention the habit to keep killing, not to mention getting killed. And you know you don't want that suffering, right? You know you don't want that suffering. Even if you don't think about lower realms, forget that. Forget Eva's point, you know, forget the dog, you know. Forget that one. But you know you don't like getting, you wouldn't like to get killed, right? You know you don't want to get sick. You, you know that, don't you? So then you think, if you can take it on board, I don't want the future karmic results of this because I don't want suffering. This is very wholesome to have and we need to have this first. And this is just, and don't, we often think in spiritual teachings, oh, that sounds selfish. It is not selfish. It's like nobody accuses you of being selfish if you stop eating sugar because you might get diabetes. They call you intelligent because you know you're producing the future person. Well, the same here. It's for your own sake. Then you think, well, whom can I turn to? So you rely upon the Buddha, his methods. He's not our creator. And that's the big difference in Christianity, as we know. It's a massive one. If I sin... I've gone against God's will. So then whom I turn to is God. And then to purify me, I have to ask God to forgive me. And his, and his forgiveness purifies me. Now, I'm not criticising that view. It's an amazing view. But Buddha would forgive you. He's a nice person. But it's not his job. You get my point? You have to purify yourself. So the second one, you rely upon the Buddha. He's like your doctor. And that's a good analogy the Buddhists use. So you're glad to have methods. And this is his method because it's called karma. So the second part of the second step this is where we really call it reliance. The first one is regret. Now reliance. You rely upon the Buddha. But the second one is you now you have compassion for those you've harmed. You realise these beings, poor little mice, you know, due to their past own dumb actions, they got killed by you. And you have compassion for them because you know they don't want to die as well. Third, you do a little kind of, you can do a kind of practice. We do different kinds of practices and mantras and different things. The third step, which is where, or even they, they call the third step the antidote, or you can call it the remedy, the four R's, the remedy. Even in ordinary daily life, 
as a remedy, you could consciously go and say, be kind to beings and help the sick and you know save animals and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, any, we would say any practice that involves the Buddha, even just imagining the Buddha, even just visualizing your purifying as a third step is very powerful. You know, you're visualizing, removing all these nonsense from your mind, these imprints. And then fourth, the crucial one, the, the resolve to not do it again. You make a special commitment, to, or even if you take vows, I don't know if you're a Buddhist and you've taken the vows, but especially to take a vow, which I'll talk about in a second. That's purification. And each of those steps, you know, that's what pure, you're changing your mind, basically. As Lama Yeshi says, one of our teachers, you create, car, you know, you create negative karma with your mind, so you purify it by creating positive, you know. It's just, it's, it's, it's the opposite. It's your mind. By changing your mind, you, you alter, you counteract the mistakes. And then, of course, when you finally realise emptiness, realise selflessness, that's when you cut all the roots all together. But you've got to kind of keep control. Kind of, this puts like atomic bombs on the seeds. And it's a really nice practice, I mean, we do these different kinds of practices, you know, but it's a really nice one just to sit there with yourself at the end of the day. Not just the killing, but, you know, you bad mouth this person, you kick the dog, you're mean to your mother, whatever. You kind of acknowledge you did and you regret because you're sick of the suffering. Then you have compassion, then you do something to do a little meditation or something to purify, and then you make a decision. I will not kill again, I will not steal, I will not... This. And then you're programming your mind with these new habits. That's all you're doing. There's no karma you can't purify. So it's in a constant flux. Huh? It's in a constant flux. What do you mean flux? You, you know, those negatives with positives, they, they, they're interacting and you can kind of, a f it's a fluid process. Well, don't, uh, so it doesn't that's... have to ripen necessarily, what you're trying to say. Oh no, you better bloody get them before they ripen, darling. I'm sorry, you've got to get yeah. ahead of the game here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want them to ripen. No, this is, to get, this is to put atomic bombs on them before they ripen. That's right. Come yeah. on. Yeah, the, that's right. Okay, so this, even you. if you've lived a life like this, living in, now, now let me talk about vows, the power of vows. Buddha loves his vows, okay? I've heard that a vow is a subtle physical form that is, clear, that is visible to clairvoyance. A vow is so potent. Lama Zopa says that you could have a person who, let's say, has got lots and lots of practices, but doesn't have merely a precept, a vow not to kill. But you've got another person who merely has a vow not to kill, but doesn't do much other practice. The second person create, is putting atomic bombs on their delusions and their past negative karma and by the power of vows is constantly enabling you to kind of nourish the mind with virtuous seeds. Because the, the way they talk about it, this is a very technical point, very practical point. Remember like I said before, karma really is the meaning is intention. Intention, I will. So at this moment we're sitting here and we're not killing anything, are we? This is a little mouse under our cushion and we can't see it. We're probably killing lots of little bugs in our body but in general, we're not killing, okay? But we're not having an intention not to kill, are we? There's no thought in your mind right now, I must not kill, because there's no being in front of you. Do you understand my point? So it's only when you meet a creature and then you make a decision, I'd better not kill it, that you pop a little non-killing seed in your mind because it's intention. But if there's no intention, there's no karma. So we're being very nice people here, not harming. I mean, you know, we're not harming people, but we're not creating any virtuous karma whatsoever. We're just resting on our laurels from our own past virtuous karma. So you've got, but having a vow not to kill, 24 hours a day you're living in that vow and keeping it purely, you're ticking over virtuous karmic seeds and you're purifying your mind. So it's like the easiest way to create virtue. Without vows, you can't get enlightened. It's just very clear. That's why it says in the teachings. Vows are so powerful psychologically. So the very bare minimum, just live in the five precepts. You couldn't, you couldn't, I mean, it's profound just to do this. Do you understand? Yes. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Over here. Just back there, yeah. Um, I just how's have our a, time going? Oh. Wait on. 8.40. What? Okay, we're fine. Go. Um, just a question on what you said before uh, about yeah. attachment and aversion. Yeah. Um, so if your mind, if you recognise your mind um, is experiencing aversion, either to, let's say, um, like you get put off by somebody, something that someone said, or you have um, frustration because your body is not functioning the way you want it, or you have back pain or something Whatever, like darling, that. Whatever, darling, that's right, exactly. Yeah, so um, how uh, would you, um, can you explain how you should meet that aversion? I understand, I understand, you know. The fact is, you see, these attachment and aversion and all the other ones, I mean, in, in modern psychology, they say there are a thousand thoughts a second. I think Buddha says even more. It's like, we don't, you know how we, we can see, can't, we, we, we can see, can't we, from the moment we wake up in the morning until the second we go to sleep, there's this constant roar underneath of thousands and thousands and thousands of thoughts, aren't there? 
but they're underneath, so we don't pay attention. So it's only when they come to the surface that we start to pay attention. Do you understand? And that's why that's a bit too late. That's why we've got to get concentration. We've got to learn to meditate so we can go deeper into the mind, calming it down, and then eventually using that skill in our daily life to help us be aware of the thoughts at an ever more subtle level before they become violent emotions. You understand? And our, part of our problem is too often in the world, we think of meditation as an alternative to appeal. That you only, you know, you wait for the dramas to happen before you go meditate. That's just insane. We've got to get ahead of the game and start to really get control of our body, speech, and mind before the big dramas happen. That's the whole point, you know. So when you a, a small, like you're using a fairly mild example, you, it's like you don't, it's not as if you want to kill somebody, right? It's not that bad. Okay, good. Um, then you you can hear, can't you? We call it attachment and we call it aversion, but you can hear that it's thoughts, isn't it? Would you agree with that? They're thoughts. What would the thoughts say? What would the aversion thoughts say? Spell it out. Say it. No, no, I know that, but give me the words this aversion th is saying. It's all thoughts in your mind. That's why, you, what's it, what are you refer it's not just a feeling in your body, it's the thoughts that inform the feeling in your body. So what are the thoughts saying? Just try to speak out attachment, speak out <laughs> like aversion. Frustration. No, speak out what it's saying. Get away from that. That's it. There you go. Yeah. How do you do that to me? It's not fair. Why don't you look at me? I said this. Why? You know, this little thoughts, this annoyed little person pops up, don't they? Mm. Well, they're thoughts. Do you agree with their thoughts? Yes. Well, you argue with them. So what's an, give a simple little argument. So that's what I'm saying. No, so sweetheart, what, give me a little <laughs> argument. What would you say to that thought? What's the valid, virtuous thing to say to that thought? This is the nature of Don't get too world. holy. Keep it practical. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I try So give to a do. simple example. <laughs> give me a simple example of a scenario, okay? Um, okay, so let's say um, there, there were people who weren't quite doing what you want them to do. One person, you're in a relationship and a particular person, you want them to do a certain thing and they don't do it. So the thought is, you get annoyed. How dare they not do what I want or something, yeah? Yeah, or they do something to annoy you. That annoys you. They don't, uh, maybe they don't do it intentionally, but something... Okay, so what they're doing is annoying you. So right. then tell me, the annoying thought is, I wish they wasn't doing that. I wish he wouldn't keep burping all the time or something like that, right? Sure. But okay, well, then give me an argument, a virtuous argument with it. Can't you hear me? But that's what I, I try But that's my to question to you. Okay. Think of something. It's common sense. Okay. What would you say? That's the nature of the world. No, that's too vague, darling. You'd say, what's your name? Mandy. Mandy. You'd say, Mandy, give it a break. They're a human being just like me. That just because they do what, you know, I, I can't get everything I want every second. Mm. Isn't that a little argument with it? Yep. Well, that just, that's, that's how you work with your mind. Okay. Be your own therapist, Lummi, as she puts it. It's, it's, you know, it's sort of surprising that it's so simple. But we keep wanting to make it all holy, you know? Mm. It's just simple. You catch your thoughts, you hear an annoyed thought, a jealous thought, an angry thought, an upset thought, and you bring your virtuous thoughts out to argue with them. Give it a break, Mandy. It's all right, darling. Don't worry about it. You know, oh, you get annoyed at the red light. It's okay. Green is coming in a minute. You talk to yourself instead of all the time buying into the angry thoughts until eventually you want to kill somebody. <laughs> it's really practical. And if you deal with little baby thoughts like this throughout the day and you calm yourself, I mean, it seems simple. But then the, the bigger dramas you can handle. Understood. Do you see my problem? Because yeah. our problem is we don't pay attention to these baby examples and they build up and by the one end of the day there's a straw that breaks the camel's back and then you shout at somebody because you're not paying attention to the smaller things. That's when we should catch them and then counteract it. It's very practical. It's so practical. It's, almost, it doesn't seem, it's not Buddha. I mean, Buddha doesn't own this stuff. This is practical. And this is what Buddha's talking about, changing your mind, you know. Do you understand? Yes, thank you. Love can speak and kindness and forgiveness, but you know, don't be sentimental and gooey about it. You know, yeah. but, and, and if you can't control yourself, then get out of the way if you can, you know? Yep. Thanks. We've got to, be, we've got to know what our, potential, what our capability is, you understand? It's like if you're an alcoholic living in a house with other alcoholics, you're trying to give it up, about time you leave, you know? Don't keep, yeah. You understand? Yes. You've got to know your own capability. Do yep. you understand? Yeah, thank Good, you. Darling. Okay, what else? We're trying to lessen delusions and grow virtues. That's the bottom line for the Buddha. That's it. That's it. It's so simple. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Just getting back to what you were saying before about attachment. Yeah. I'm just not sure how... So from a Buddhist point of view, maybe from your point of view, also from your point of view, how, do, how does family fit in with Buddhism? Because it's my understanding that we're trying to create love and compassion for all sentient of course beings we are, yeah. equally. Of course we are. That's huge, isn't it? So how do we... Well, that's... I mean, the way I'd put that is you've got karmic connections. Okay. We've got 
All of us have got karmic connections with certain people from past lives. We, bump, we jump into that family because you've got a strong karmic connection. You've got a strong karmic debt to that mummy, the mummy that you run to, you know, let's say. So you've got close connections with lots of people in this life. And so whether you're a monk or a nun, it's the same thing. I've got this family, you know, seven siblings and a mummy and a daddy and aunties and all. all my, there was a, a close connection. But in my case, just because of my personality, I mean, can you imagine me married to somebody? I mean, I always say they'd be dead if I had a husband, you know? <laughs> it's a fact. And luckily, I, I mean, I'm not trying to kid, but it was very clear to me all my life. I wanted happiness. I wanted sex and drugs and whatever, but I didn't want husbands and living in this. I mean, just the thought of living in the same bed with one person, I'd rather go to prison. And I, I mean, I hyperventilate at the thought of it. I mean it sincerely. I could not cope, you know? I never wanted a baby. So we've all got different minds, luckily, right? So some people, like you, Maybe if you want a family, because there's certain karmic connections with certain people, you know. So then you, you do it with virtue. You do it with virtue, you know. So you have to control your attachment, you know, jump on them four times a day, try and give them a bit of break. You control your attachment, you control your speech, you control your body, you control your delusions, and you try to practice love and compassion and kindness. Bottom line. And so just reduce the attachment. That's it. Bottom, I mean, if you can be radical enough to give up sex, drugs, and rock and roll and go to the mountains, that's the quickest way to get the realisations. Of course it is. If you want to become like Lance Armstrong, I always use him as an example. I know he's naughty now. You can't just be a bicyclist once a week. You've got to do it full time every day. That's why Lord Buddha says you best take vows and go into the forest or the mountains so you can do the job seriously and really quickly. But most of us won't do that. Even most monks and nuns I know, including me, won't go to the mountains this life. Do you understand? Yes. So you know who you are, you know where you're at, you do it with a valid motivation to want to be kind and loving, and you know, I mean, really, don't have a fantasy, because, I mean, it's not a joke. I, I say this, and it's not meant to be a joke. When we really understand attachment, it should break our hearts. 40, you know the 40% of all female people on this planet who get killed? You know who kills them, don't you? The bloke in the same bed. So the fantasy, of the romantic fantasy, attachment fantasy, is, like, is really quite disgusting to think about. It's hard work. I can't imagine how you live with one person and several children. Look at the suffering here. I couldn't cope with that level of suffering. And I'm not being sar but I'm not being sarcastic, you know. For me, it's easier to be having my own space and do my own thing and not to have that intensity of those close things where it demands every second of the day you're working on your attachment, your anger. If you're brave enough, it's the best way to practice. But it's so, really tough. But be practical, be realistic. But do it for a valid reason, to, to bring good children to the planet, yep. to help them become better human beings. How marvellous. So should we be trying to cultivate um, our love and compassion like for everyone else to the same sort of level? Yeah, but you see, that you can or? still... You can, you see, okay, that's the thing. You can still... You practice that. So you got let's say you've got your kid and you love your... You're attached to your kid and you can't stand this ugly kid next door, let's say. You know? Do you understand? Yes. You see it in your mind. But you, you practice all these different things. You know they're both the same as each other. You know they both want to be happy. It's only because your attachment and your connection that you think your son's so gorgeous. So you know this in yourself. But you still have compassion for the kid next door. But this other one... The, the, the mistaken idea of you've got to have compassion for everybody sort of means, well, he might as well bring the guy next door at home. No, you, you, you don't bring the next door kid home to have, and swap kids. You've got a karmic connection with your kid. Mm -hmm. and, but you, you have to work with the attachment. Practice the love and the compassion. But equally have compassion for the stranger, for the other one whom you can't stand. You work on your mind, but you still leave them there. You understand? Yes. And the great, I mean, all the great holy beings who have this, they, you've still got karmic connection with certain people. And that's from past history. You understand? Yes. I'm very new Thank in you. this year, okay. so forgive me for asking perhaps a stupid question. But is attachment a foolish thing? Is it what? Attachment, is that a foolish thing? Because I see, I understand. I think what we have to do is be very clear here that the way we use that word in English, in our culture, that's, it's, a different, it's a completely different state of mind. We, okay, first of all, you know that same, similar words can have different definitions. Do you agree with that? You accept that, don't you? Yes. That, for example, if you learn geometry, you learn that that is flat, don't you? If you play music, you play something in B flat. It's the same word, same spelling, but completely different meaning. You accept that that's possible, yeah? Well, attachment here, the way Buddha describes it, has got nothing to do with the way we use attachment in our world, which means to be close to somebody, or she's got an attachment to her family. In the way we use it in ordinary modern society, that's a good quality. But what we're talking here is like a monster inside us that's completely like a junkie that if you saw it in a raw form, you would be a junkie, basically. You'd be completely self-centred. You'd be a total monster. So that's not how we use the word attachment. You've got to really realise Buddha's definition is not the same way we use it. That's why there's so much confusion about it. 
It's, it's a, a violent, demanding, constant craving that I get what I want every second. And when you realise that anger, and look at the world, is because of attachment. That's why people go crazy and kill each other, because their attachment didn't get what it wanted. So it's a monster inside us. I know it sounds weird to talk this way. It sounds so fundamentalist. But that's the Buddha's view. Are you with me? Yeah. It's not what we mean by attachment at all. Close to people and loving and kind. It's, and it's very subtle. It's a honey-covered razor blade. Do you understand? Okay. Someone else. 8.53. A few more minutes. But it's more like midnight because I talk three times the pace of other people. <laughs> it has been proved. So what can I say? <laughs> so you got your money's worth. Go on. So... Um, the question that I was asking about relationships and then Mandy asked a, a better question, pretty much what I was asking and you said that you argue with the things that are coming yes. up and so... That's day to day practice and it sounds really corny but Lama Yeshi would say be your own therapist, it sounds cute but it really is true. That has to be, and that even if you, before you go on, just even if you get some benefit from doing a bit of meditation every morning, forget about getting single point of concentration. The thing that you will get is the ability, because you've stepped out of your head for five minutes, you, you develop the ability in ordinary daily life to be more conscious of what the hell is going on in here. Whereas before we were completely blind as a bat and couldn't hear anything until it vomited out the mouth. That's our tragedy. You become more conscious and you hear the thoughts and you argue. It's such a simple way to put it. Okay, that's understand. what I was going to ask there because you, you were saying first is junior school where you... At least you stop the speech first. And I can't do that. No, so well, no you can. Well... No, sweetheart, if you can't control your speech first, forget about controlling your mind. Oh, no, but what I mean is that huh? so, uh, I'm noticing more and more that I, I can hear the thoughts and they burble up anyway. But um, you were saying that if you begin with controlling the your speech, speech yes. and, and your mind... No, the speech can't. first, the speech first. Right. At least don't, th th that already does demand, doesn't it, some awareness of what's happening in your thoughts. Yes. It still demands that, but yes. instead of really, you see, the more advanced practice is when you meditate, where you're trying to harness the thoughts. Yeah. But you, until you can harness your body in speech, it's very hard to harness your thoughts. But you start looking at your thoughts, but so that you can control your speech. At least be aware of it, and okay, okay, girl, silence. That's powerful. Then you get more space and can really then start being the arguing, working with it internally. Do you understand? And so the helping of the meditation, the single point, don't yeah. begin. Don't begin with that. Just well, you could. I mean, that, no, 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 always it will help. There's no question. Yeah. It's more that what I'm saying is, the teachings are very incremental. You can't get control over your mind until you control your body and speech. But you can do both because each will help the other. There's no question. Do you understand? And you can't really have valid compassion for others until you've got compassion for yourself. Buddha doesn't say it that way, but that means abiding by the laws of karma out of self-respect, because you're sick of suffering. So you really then can have compassion for others when you know out of self-respect that you're sick of suffering you don't want to harm yourself. So there's things, it's incremental, the practices are gradual, you know. But you do as much as you can of all. Do you understand? And really, that's really what you're doing as a Buddhist. You're controlling your body, speech and mind. And you're trying to, energy, you're trying to channel the energy, Lessen it, con first try to control it, and then you become more aware of all the thoughts and you do your concentration so that the mind can get a bit of space. But then most of your day you're not going to be in meditation. You're going to be noticing all your crazy thoughts. You're in the traffic in here and there's dramas and husbands and children, God knows what. I mean, life's intense, you know. So the more awareness you can have of what's in here and not to be scared of it. Part of our problem, I think, a misconception about meditation is because we do it when it's too late, we do it when the dramas happen, then by that point we can't stand the pain. So we just hope it'll, it'll make it all go away. This is just naive. It won't just all go away. We've got to learn so if we can become more aware of the baby things happening in here before, you know, it's too late, before, it's sort of a bit like... You know, you're driving in the road at 120 k's an hour and suddenly you decide your wheels are falling off. Oh, what will I do? Well, it's a bit late, isn't it? Because, you know, you've never heard of maintenance. That's really a good analogy for our minds. We maintain our bodies, we maintain our cars, our houses, everything we understand is preventative. But we don't have preventative for our minds. We wait till we have depression to, or you want to kill yourself or someone else before we do something about it. And that's what I'm getting at here. Ordinary daily life. Do you have to be some great meditator? Do be a monk or a nun to do this? Just some a genuine wish to notice what's in here and not just dump it on the outside all the time. And this is massive already. And learn to harness this energy and talk yourself through it. Practical, ordinary, down-to-earth, inner psychology, I tell Got you. Got it.
Thank you. Do you understand? Yeah, thank you. Because the bottom line for the Buddha, we're trying to lessen delusions and grow virtues. Bottom line, you know. And eventually, of course, realise emptiness and get the hell out of all of it. Finish the lot, you know. And then if you're a bodhisattva, you go into the compassion wing and you keep on coming back. I remember telling a Christian about that. It was wonderful. I in Kathmandu, some Lutherans came and wanted to know about Buddhism. So we talked about karma and everything. <laughs> and when I told him about wanting to keep coming back again and again to help others, he was shocked. He was so straightforward. He said, oh, no, that's horrible. I don't want to do that. I want to go to heaven with God, please. I said, that's okay. You can do that too. <laughs> but when I told him about karma, how we are responsible, there's no punisher and there's no rewarder, it was a very good point that he brought up. He said, how come there's not anarchy among Buddhists? Because the assumption is we need, we need policing, you see. But there's no one policing us. That's why Eva, you're, you're your own policeman, your own boss, your own creator, your own punisher, your own rewarder, baby. <laughs> you understand? It's very scary to think that, actually, but we've got to realise it. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll sing a little prayer to finish. Can I do that? Right. Is that a question? Let her have it. Come on. Last question. Hold on. Go, sweetheart. Uh, are you coming back anytime soon? Um, next year, probably. I keep going around. Thank I you. Sort of circle the globe. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, when Venerable is in Melbourne, yeah. we will invite Venerable here back okay. again. I'm happy to come back. As long as I live, <laughs> I'll keep coming back. So I'll sing a little prayer to finish. It's two little prayers. One is we call it a dedication. And it's really just saying, here we've been for, you know, an hour and a half, and as many th moments as there have been is as many seeds we've planted, you know. They're all gone in. They don't, get a, they don't go astray. So we're very delighted. We think we're going to nourish these seeds with our effort from this moment to see our mind, control our body, control our speech, control our mind, so we can develop this marvellous potential that Buddha says we've all got, so we can be of help to others on this planet, you know. At least this, at least this much. And then second little prayer, make compassion grow and grow in the heart. Ke wa di nyu du dag, lama sangge drup gyurne, dro wa chi kyang ma lu pa, de sa la ke pa Jang chub sem chog rimpo che, ma ke panam ke guchig, ke panyam pa me payang, gong ne gong du pa ba shog. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. And never give up, okay? Just never give up is all I can say. Never give up. Never give up, okay?